Church. My name is Jamie. I'm one of the leaders here at Trinity Life Church, and this is Emily. And this week we are going through the ser sermon series "Broken, Battered, But Building," and we're reading through Nehemiah. And this week we're reading Nehemiah seven. Um, and the sermon title for this week is "Friends in Reaping." So we wanted to talk a little bit about friendship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, a lot of you know that there's been just a really hard season for our church. Um, and I was actually just sharing with Jamie earlier today. I was sitting across from Jamie and Dave and just was so thankful at the abundance that has been coming from our relationship in the last bunch of months. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful that we've had like all these years, we've been friends for years and we've kind of invested, wouldn't you say, into each other's lives and relationships. Yeah. And I think in the last bunch of months, we've really reaped the benefit yeah. of that sewing. Yeah, like we haven't always been as close as we are now, but we've been investing and pouring into one another on and off over the last, I don't know, nine years. Yeah. And the last two years, I'd say, we've really started to reap mm -hmm. um, and the blessing and the abundance mm -hmm. out of that has been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. And I think just for practical reasons, like some of those things look like watching each other's kids, hanging out, doing dinners together, having fun together, praying together, um, dreaming together. Yeah. I think it's kind of all of those things. And so hopefully you guys can take something away from that. Um, yeah. So we're going to go into reading the scripture and then worship. Um, and so I want to bless you guys to have an amazing time of worship, just be in the moment with God and reap that blessing. Um, and we bless you with that.
Come on, let's sing it out. And what is a mountain but a stone for you to throw, a height for you to level in, to make your glory known? And what is an ocean but a road for you to walk, waves to sink our fear as you lift us up? And almighty, triumphant, in the final word, and I'm shakeable, uncontainable, the Lord of What is a desert? What a place for us to sing of your unfailing promise now of every good thing. What is a grave? What a hill on which you stand, a solid ground for you to lead your victory day. They bow humbly before Jesus, victor forever. Yes, you are, you are. Jesus, victor forever. As we worship, let's just take 30 seconds and reflect on the hope for the harvest. What I mean by that is how can we prepare for um, and expect God to do amazing things in our lives in the areas that we are faithfully and kingdom mindedly serving. So take 30 seconds and just pray to yourselves and discuss that with the Lord. Time. 
time and time again You've proven You'll do just what you said Though the storms may come And the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast And let my heart learn When you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faithfulness to me Oh, great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I praise your name great is your faithfulness to
rising sun to the setting sun. I will praise your name. Society is reeling and crumbling under the weight of global disruption. Relationships are broken and tattered under the stress of loneliness, polarization, and discord. Have you started to feel like an outsider lately? Have you been standing on the edge of social spaces where you previously felt at home? How about relationships that used to be normal or regular? Do they feel forced and awkward? It's like more and more of us are exiles in our own life. Likewise, the people of God in the Old Testament were homeless exiles when their city and society was broken and in shambles. The people were under foreign rule by a harsh dictator, battered by the ruling class and isolated from their culture and life that they previously enjoyed. Nehemiah helps the people rebuild the city of God, return home and forge ahead in experiencing God's promises for them as a community. Our community is also grieving. We've experienced loss. Many of us are experiencing changes in our relationships. We miss our friends and family. We feel like we are outsiders and exiles who have been battered and broken, but like God's people in the Old Testament, we still have a hope, a mission, and will continue building something beautiful. Hey Trinity Life, Adam here and we are continuing on in Nehemiah and I'm excited to continue to dive into the scriptures. I hope you've been reading this book over and over and over. You should align your devotional life with the devotional life of your community and so hopefully you're, you're becoming an expert on Nehemiah. You're already reading ahead. You know what's coming up. God's speaking to you through this and so this is a time where we compare notes and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us collectively. So here we are in chapter 7, and today we're going to talk about being friends in the reaping, okay? The reaping being, um, you know, you take your scythe, you heard of the grim reaper who's got a big scythe, because the reaping would happen when you come to a field and you take your scythe and you sheathe down t tall stalks of wheat or uh, whatever type of crop is good for sheathing down in mass quantities and you would reap the harvest and bundle it up, take it home, shake off the grain, uh, whatever you would do, right? And so, uh, and so if you plant seeds at the right time and you nurture them, when it's time and you've done your job and the water has come, uh, you get to reap the harvest, okay? So Nehemiah and the people here, they've, they've committed themselves to the mission of God. They've sown many seeds over the last 52 days. They're starting to reap a harvest, right, of, of a finished wall and freshly established leaders and a committed vision. And, uh, and it's time to harvest all of that and continue to build into the next season. So... Um, now, at, during times of harvest, it's very important that you have the necessary infrastructure set up uh, to deal with the crop that's incoming. You want to be able to store it and preserve it and all this stuff or else it goes to waste. And so, um, like I talked about last week, Emily and I, last summer, we turned a bunch of people's backyards into little farm garden plots. And then we'd go to market, we'd harvest all the crops every week, we'd go to market and, uh, and meet people and engage with our neighbors and it was a great time. It's a great time, great for the kids to learn about uh, economics and uh, running a business and uh, engaging with customers and, and you know, all of that stuff. So um, on a harvest day, though, I'd take, you know, uh, a few hours on Friday and, um, and we would harvest all the microgreens and package them all. Um, you know, you'd have to have your infrastructure in place, like I said. So for us, that was a bunch of coolers. The ice, all the ice packs needed to be uh, frozen. Um, we'd have our harvesting knives and our baskets and all of our packaging and labels ready to go to, to get it all done efficiently in an organized manner so that stuff would um, get done uh, in a rhythm that worked for our family 
family, but then also preserve well enough for the next day at market, right? And so um, you could extrapolate this to a, uh, a larger operation, right, where you have big machines or large teams of people who come in and pull up all the crops. Um, we were doing tours of little farms in Ontario. It's kind of fun um, uh, the year before. And we, we went to this one, I think it was a 25 acre farm and we got to see them as the big machine with a few people around it was pulling the carrots up out of the ground and they're getting dumped into big baskets and it was all sorts of fun. Um, really cool, right? But for them, they're not just storing, you know, stuff in little coolers. They need, they need huge, you know, industrial size uh, fridges with you know, tons of, they start everything in Rubbermaid bins organized by type and variety and size. Because <clears throat> um, they had to last, they had to make it last for a long time, right? Uh, they need big crates to categorize uh, all the different unique items. And they needed all the infrastructure of their marketing in place and their supply chain in place so they could sell to grocery stores throughout. I think that one was in the, the Kingston area. <clears throat> um, so you could get things on time to all the different places so nothing went bad, right? And so that's a good point. What happens when the proper infrastructure is not in place to reap your harvest and steward it well? What tends to happen? Well, uh, sometimes it could be that you just don't harvest the crops in time. You're too overwhelmed. There's too much to do. You spent too long pulling the potatoes. You didn't have time for the carrots, right? Um, and what can happen if that's the case? Well, if stuff stays in the ground too long, um, it, it does what's, what's called bolting, right? It get red, gets ready to go to seed. It finalizes its life cycle. It gets ready to, to die and plant new seeds in the ground for the next year, right? And what happens when things bolt? They get bitter and they get hard, right? So we had, um, we had a little carrot patch. It's about like, you know, 12, 14 feet long by 30 inches wide. And, uh, and we sewed a bunch of multicolored carrots in there and um, we, we weren't sure how long should they be. And, you know, it was our first time, so we didn't really know. And some, some of them kind of one off would, uh, would, would start to bolt, right? And so we, oh no, you know, so we pull it out. And I remember biting into one and being like, ah! And it was like almost rock solid. It was hard. So it's hard and it was bitter. And so it's no good for eating. It's no good for sustaining life anymore. Its only function is to die to produce something for next year, right? That's its only good function at that life stage. And so crops don't get harvested in time. It gets wasted and you got to wait a whole other year. Uh, another option is it just rots in the ground right? And it never produces seed. Um, that's if it like, it didn't get time to bolt and winter came or the frost killed it or something like that, right? And you didn't get out of the ground and the timing was off and all that. It could just rot in the ground, never produce seed, never produce new life. Um, could also be, let's say you do get a bunch of crops out of the ground, right? You do reap. Uh, it could be that you can't store them long enough right? It's always the problem. Everyone's got great ideas until it comes to executing because all sorts of other things you don't think about come up, right? You can have a great product, you know, like let's say you're selling widgets like a phone, um, but you got to find the people who want to buy the phone. And so you got to store an inventory of phones long enough to get it to those people. And so with, with food, the, the issue is always how do we preserve it? How do we store it long enough? How do we refrigerate it or package it or cure it or smoke it or dry it or can it or whatever to store it long enough so that the people can enjoy it. Because um, what can happen is, and you all have experienced this, I'm sure, you know, you, you get a little package of strawberries and you look at it from the outside, everything looks fine. Then you open it, you eat a couple off the top and the next layer down is mold rotten strawberries. It's the worst. <clears throat> And you're robbed of that joy before you can even enjoy those uh, fruits. And so, like we all do, we try and get them in the crisper in the fridge and, you know, it helps keep them fresher, longer. Um, and uh, if this is the case, in this case, you got, you know, you're a farmer and you got your big fridge and you're trying to store your stuff and it's starting to rot. It's like you never get to see the profit for that. You put all the energy, all the input, all the time, all the attention, all of the emotion and zero profit 
from your labor. And that makes it harder to survive in the winter months, right? Uh, you don't you, you don't have food to eat because you didn't preserve it properly. Uh, and so you have to spend other resources for food for you to eat, right? Or if you're just selling it, you didn't get the profit from that in order to sustain yourself uh, through the winter. And so you have to get the right infrastructure in place in order to handle the harvest. And we'll see right here that intimacy with God is the best infrastructure for a sustained life of reaping fruit and blessing from God. Intimacy with God will be your best infrastructure for a sustained life of reaping the fruit and blessings of the kingdom. Okay, so let's start reading. Chapter 7, verse 5. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the peoples to be enrolled by genealogy. God put it into my heart. Nehemiah is a man who has intimacy with God. He spends months praying at the beginning. He checks in in prayer throughout. And here it is. God is continuing to bless him with burdens on his heart. So, how are you doing in your heart? What is on your heart? What has God put there? What are the desires that you have? What are the things that you're so sure God has placed this dream in my heart? I want to see it realized. What does your intimacy with God look like? If you're new to the faith, how is that going? Maybe it was going really well at at the beginning, but now you're like, oh, I actually have to, like a real adult relationship, I have to, you know, uh, text, I have to call, I have to arrange times to hang out, we got to organize fun activities or else the relationship just kind of withers and fades into nothing, right? Same thing with your relationship with God. You have to manage it, you have to sustain it, you have to participate in it, right? This isn't a to-do list, but relationships are meant to be participated in. You don't have a relationship with somebody who you don't see. You don't have a relationship with someone that you don't hang out with. So relationships are meant to be participated in. And here's another good question. What type of community action comes from your relationship with God? Is it just for you so you can feel good and accomplish more in your life and make more money? Or is something beneficial for the sake of the community coming out of your relationship with God? So for Nehemiah, his burden is to, uh, is to create the list so that everybody knows who they are, where they're going, what, they, what they're doing, all of their family members, um, so they can organize into the future, into the next season, right? And so Nehemiah, on this journey, he finds this old list of people who came back to Jerusalem previously, right? What can we learn from this list? What can we learn from this list? Well, I want to posit to you something that a friend, a dear friend of mine has said to me. People are hurt in relationship and people are healed in relationship. People are hurt in relationship and people are healed in relationship, right? These are the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town or neighborhood, right? They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, not this Nehemiah, different Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramiah, Nahamani, Mordecai, a different Mordecai, not the one in Esther, Bilshan, Mispareth, Bigvi, Nahum, and Bena. The number of the men of the people of Israel. Oh, and then we'll, we'll pause there for a second, right? Okay, so, um, uh, he finds this list of exiles. They are, they are downtrodden and broken. They want to make an attempt to escape exile. So they come back to Jerusalem. It's in ruins and it lays in ruins for many, many years. And they need, the, they need Nehemiah, the burden of his heart, and the people that he brings with him, and the relationships that end up being formed together by the families who existed there. Like we saw in Friends of... Uh, of of justice and friends of generosity. They needed the two, the, the previous um, wave that came and this wave that came to meet together 
to experience healing in relationship. Okay, and this is part of what they reap as friends in the reaping. They reap healing and they reap relationship together. People are hurt in relationship and they're healed in relationship. Um, we see here that the people are then listed by their kinship, by their families. <clears throat> families are the basic building block of the church. And then put groups of families together and you're setting yourself up for much greater exponential impact, right? Those individuals can have, then have relational identity together as God's people, together as the church, together as the Old Testament people of God. Um, and that group identity does something to heal them in relationship together as we'll see as the book continues on later. So here's a good question as we pause before we get into all these families, right? The sons of Parosh, 2,172. The sons of uh, Shephatiah, 372. The sons of et cetera, et cetera, right? So all these families, all this kinship. Um, how do you identify yourself? How do you identify yourself? Um, we often identify ourselves in relationship to things, activities, people, and hopefully, most of all, God, right? So uh, you can identify yourself with things. Well, I'm the guy who has the iPhone. I'm an iPhone guy, right? Or I'm an Android guy. It's okay to be wrong. <clears throat> we can also identify ourselves with the activities we involve ourselves in, right? So I'm a soccer player or I'm a, um, whatever you do, I'm an artist, I'm a photographer, I'm, a, I'm an accountant, I'm a, right, the activities that you participate in. Um, or how about people? I am a brother, right? I am a son, I have a mother, right? We identify ourselves, or I'm friends with so-and-so, right? Who's really cool. Or you identify yourself in relationship to God. I'm a son of God. I'm a Christian, a Christ, a little Christ, right? I am a follower of Jesus. I am forgiven by God. I am made new by God. I am a new creation in Christ. How do you identify yourself? Because your most powerful identification will become, and it should be the bedrock of who you are, so that when some of the other things higher up on the, that you place, think of it like a tower, right? And so you stack all these things up like a Jenga tower. Your relationship with God wants to, should be the foundational layer, right? And your relationship to things, those should be at the top. Because you can, you can flick those things off, right? Like I could smash my phone right now and, well, maybe I'm no longer an iPhone guy, right? And who cares? You know, who cares? It's just a phone. It doesn't matter, right? This thing isn't me, right? But imagine if you took that one and you placed it underneath as the foundation to your relationship with God. And as the tower shakes and weathers the storm, imagine your identity with God gets knocked off the top. Or, sorry, imagine you then smash your iPhone, right? And you're, you're, you're identifying yourself with God is up here and your iPhone's here and the iPhone gets smashed, right? Well, your identity with God could just fall off the table. It could just be done, right? It's just shaking you so much, whatever that thing is that you put at the foundation. Let's say it's relationships to people. And five years ago, my mom passed away, right? If that relationship was at the, the foundational layer of my identity, right, that I'm a son to that person, my relationship with God could just crumble and fall down off the table. I don't know how I could follow Jesus. God is horrible to me. God is cursing me. God is taking from me. Woe is me. There's no blessing. There's no hope. I can't see any good future. God, why, why, why? Because maybe the, relation, the, the wrong identity was at the bottom of the stack. How do you identify yourself? What we also see here is that sonship is essential. 
It's our identity. Why? Sons have a place in the family. Sons have a place in the community. They don't have to fight for their place. They are bestowed their place by their father. And ladies, this includes you too, because if I can be the bride of Jesus, you can be the son or a son. And you see, sons have an inheritance. Isn't that amazing? Psalm 16, the lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a great inheritance. Oh, that verse has been such a comfort. That promise, that truth has been such a comfort to me as we navigate this season as a community. Sons have an inheritance. Surely the lines, right? The boundaries of the place in which God has assigned for me in his, within his community, within his people, within his mission, within his purpose, within his plan. Surely the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a good inheritance. Sons have identity. The sons of Parosh, that's the father. Sons have identity in relationship to their father. Likewise, the Christian has identity in relationship to the heavenly father. Sons have affection, love, attention. Sons have approval. You're on the list, son. You're allowed in. See, Jesus is the eternal son, gifting relationship with the Father to all who trust him. So if you're new, if you're unsure, if you find yourself wondering, who am I? What is the point of my life? Which we should all ask. If you don't ask that, you're just as lost as I was 10 years ago. Just lost. And I don't have all the answers. And I don't have it figured out. There's one thing that I do have figured out. I have a relationship with the Father, and I am a son, and I have an inheritance, and I am loved, and known, and protected, and cared for, and kept safe, sealed for salvation by His Holy Spirit. And that changes everything. So if you're new, I would encourage you, receive that identity as a son, through the Son, that Jesus gives freely to you so that you can know a loving Heavenly Father. And Jesus, so we reap, Nehemiah is reaping, the community of God's people is reaping the fruit of all of their labor as more and more people continue to come back to the promised land. Jesus likewise is reaping you. He wants to reap you. You are his harvest. Your life, your faith, your worship, your devotion. So I would encourage you, Allow yourself to be reaped. Be open-handed. God, whatever you want, whenever you want, with me and with my life. And so what we see here is that as communities grow, the teams become more specialized. We saw in the early parts of uh, chapter seven <clears throat> um, last week, right? The gatekeepers, singers, and the Levites and priests, okay? So the gatekeepers, they work offsite. They're, you know, they're kind of like the offsite home group, the R3, the offsite Bible study, whatever they're doing. And as you guys, as we navigate our life together and find ourselves in new communities or new cities and new towns, right? So many people got married and left like uh, a year, two years ago, right? Got married, find a place, find a new place in the world to live. Um, wherever you find yourself, some people work offsite, right? Okay. Those are the gatekeepers. They work on the edges of the town. They're leaders in their neighborhood. They're leaders on the outskirts, right? Some people are singers. They're very much on site. They work in the temple. They, uh, they're mentioned 18 times here. They're the creatives, the band, the worship team. Um, they have very highly specialized roles and skills. Um, think Jonathan, who sets up all this camera stuff, because I'm like, ah, I don't know how it works, and the perfect lighting, the hair lights, and the fill lights, and the key lights or whatever is going on here to make it look really good. Highly specialized roles. You know, only him and Dave can do this role, right? And probably most of us could hold the door open. Probably most of us could make someone a peanut butter sandwich, right? Show some hospitality, but only these two guys can play this role. 
right? And they, they're this, they're the, the singers here in the verse, and they work on site. And then we have the Levites, and they work on and off site, as we'll see as we continue to look on, right? Um, they work in the temple, but then they also work in the neighborhoods, organizing communities of worship and teaching the Bible and um, doing the weddings and the funerals and the uh, neighborhood engagements and hiring and firing staff in the temple and training new leaders to succeed them um, and so on and so forth. And so think about, relate this to um, not just the organization of God's people, but the family and your family. What happens when you go from one, one child to two children, right? Well... You no longer have one person can watch the child and the other can be free, right? Now it's man to man and both parents are managing one child, right? And no one gets any free time anymore, right? Things drastically change and you have to navigate. You have to shift and adjust and put new structures in place, reorganize, right? Um, and so as we find ourselves in new communities and as we spread like seeds across the city, uh, you might find different types of organizations, small churches, big churches, um, small families, big families, right? Like I have a small family. I think I only know of like one cousin of mine, you know? Whereas some families have like 30 cousins. <laughs> Um, founders of organizations, right? So we're, we were a small church plant and, uh, and you know, we started with a couple founders and, and those founders usually are the jack of all trades. They do everything. They do 50 things really well. But as the family grows, as the organization grows, um, it usually uh, needs to transition to have smaller um, and sometimes more casual teams. So when we had a leadership team of six, you know, everyone kind of did a little bit of everything, but we were a little bit specialized and it was fairly casual, you know? Um, and, uh, it, you know, it continues to grow and it becomes kind of like hockey. So here we are, you know, Trinity Life's leadership team, six people, it's kind of like a hockey team. Um, at the time of this recording, I think the Leafs are, are in game two of, uh, facing off against the Panthers. Let's see how they do on that. Good job making it past the first round, boys. Um, and on a hockey team, right, the captain sets the tone. If the captain's scoring, everyone else is like, yes, let's do this thing, right? The captain leads the team, um, but it's still pretty casual and loose, right? Like you can't, it's hard to set the exact plays. There's not a lot of finesse. It's very much like get out there, get it done. It's more about the energy, right? Um, but on a football team, right, it's stop, set, very precise. The quarterback does this, the linemen do this, the, uh, the running backs do, I don't know football as well, so I hope I don't upset some of you football players, right? But you need much more planning, a lot more organization. You're talking about 50 players and not just one team, but teams of teams, the special teams, the offense, the defense. Um, and there's... Uh, uh, and there's highly, highly, highly specialized roles, right? I remember watching uh, with Isaac one day and, uh, and the kicker came out and the kicker came out and he puts on this funny voice like, yeah, hey guys, here I am, I'm gonna kick the ball, eh! right? And he kicks, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's your one job, dude. And I th he missed the kick and it was like, oh man, it's like, dude, that was your one job, your highly specialized role, the only reason you're here, the only reason you get paid money. Right. Um, and so you see there, right, highly specialized and you and you hire in the top talent, you know, and decisions are very important and a lot of a lots at stake in each of those uh, decisions and lots of money is on the line as the organization grows. Right. And so we're going to find ourselves in all sorts of different places and whatever family, you know, that you find yourself in at any given different point in your life you get to uh, just embrace the reality and the season of life for that community. <clears throat> Think about this. Let's say you are three. Hopefully you guys stick around and continue to live on mission together in your neighborhood. Um, what happened if your group doubled in size? Because like a whole bunch of non-Christians just were really interested. You did a, you did a neighborhood engagement um, and, you know, a couple people are doing a thing over here, a couple people are doing a thing over here. Uh, you know, you did your big neighbor engagement together. And then all of a sudden, people from all of those different efforts, they all decide to start coming at the same time, right? 
Well, all of a sudden there's not enough people to volunteer to help with the kids because you got too many kids and you need two people or three people instead of just one person. Uh, there's not enough food. You need more people to be bringing more food because oftentimes the new people don't bring food because you want to be hospitable and you want to make them feel welcome and you want to be generous. Um, it's just hard for your R3 leader to cultivate that many relationships. So you need more leaders. Um, there's a lot more people who need to go through rise all at the same time and get the basics and the foundations of the faith. So what would happen to your group if all of a sudden you just doubled in size, right? Um, there's a beautiful uh, part of the scriptures, Luke chapter five, um, where Jesus gets out on a boat and he did some teaching and then he tells them, they've been fishing all day and he tells the disciples, hey, throw your nets in again over there. They're like, well, we've been fishing all day. We didn't catch anything, but I guess we'll listen to you because um, you just talked about the kingdom for a while. Um, and they throw their nets in and they started lifting them out. They had so many fish that their nets started to break. And the point is here, they got a harvest. They reaped a harvest that was more than the infrastructure could sustain. Jesus was giving abundance, but they didn't have the right infrastructure to be able to handle the abundance. And so wherever we end up, always be preparing for the abundance that God wants to give you in the future when you least expect it. So submit to things like leadership development, submit to things um, like planning, preparation, coaching, submit to things like mentorship, submit to the structures, submit to the leadership, because they are preparing for that community the ability to capture the abundance that God wants to give to his people. See, I believe that God has been shifting pieces around the chessboard of the church, of the world, for the last three years. Because he's preparing to make a major play on the enemy. And the enemy is not going to see it coming. For us to participate in that, it's going to take dependence on Jesus. To see it, to see the play. It's going to take faith in Jesus to be ready for it. Much like um, uh, Noah had to have faith before he saw the rain to build a boat in the middle of a desert. It will take preparation for Jesus in order to experience it. And it will take intimacy with Jesus to enjoy it. Take dependence on Jesus to see it. Take faith in Jesus to be ready for it. It will take preparation for Jesus to experience it. And it will take intimacy with Jesus to enjoy it. And I want you to enjoy the reaping that comes. I want your nets to be ready for the abundance that God wants to give you. Um, now, as we reach the end, my page just jumped here. As we reach the end, we see, um, well, let's read here. So the following were those who came up from Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adon, and Immer, uh, but they could not prove their father's houses nor their descendant, whether they belonged to Israel, so on and so forth. And they list them, right? And they list all the people who they didn't know. <clears throat> the reaping of leaders is only possible in trusting relationships, right? Without relationship, there's no success successorship okay and they have some people here so also some of the priests and um these sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies but it was not found there so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean and the governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until a priest with urim and thummim should arise okay character beats competence you say you were a priest but you weren't registered Nobody knew you. You weren't amongst the family and the people. Otherwise, your name would be here. You say you're a priest, but your character does not match with your testimony. Right? Competence is important. See, the job can't get done 
without competence. Things fall through the cracks without competence. New creative ideas are ignored and never get implemented without competence. But character allows competence to be exponential, lasting, and most importantly, loving. Right? You can be amazing at something, but be a total jerk. And so character allows competence to be loving. Faithful character combined with reasonable competence is necessary for reaping generational harvest, also known as legacy. Faithfulness to something greater than yourself requires one. Okay, so if we're going to reap generational legacy here, guys, we're going to need to lay down preferences, right? That shows good character. You're going to need to try things before criticizing things. We're all going to enter into new places at some point in life. And you're need, going to need to try and submit before you criticize. You're going to need to be all in despite your doubts. You're going to see things. You're going to hear things. They're not quite going to be perfect. right? But be all in despite your doubts. Oftentimes the things that bug you are the things that God is bringing you to a place to fix. You need to honor those who have authority over you. You need to submit to the greater vision that they have cast over that community instead of fighting it, frustrating it, like we've seen in this book. Change and creative thinking are necessary as you are brought into the unknown. Okay? Character will lead you towards change. Character will lead you towards creative thinking. Character will lead you into the unknown, not just competence. See, competence can go into the unknown, but it cannot survive there. It cannot survive there. Character is necessary for surviving in change and creativity in the unknown. Otherwise, you will just suffer and die doing the same thing over and over. This is really hard for us. This is really hard for us. See, God's people have a history of grumbling when things change. Hey, you're set free to live free. Go out of Egypt, out of slavery. And then they get out there, woohoo! And then they keep going a little bit. Like, oh, what do we eat? Ugh, it's hot. Ugh, this is a long walk. Why did we leave slavery? We had food. We didn't have to walk around. We were getting. We're getting beaten and exploited and whatever, but you know, it wasn't so bad, was it? God's people have a history of grumbling when things change. Things are changing at Trinity Life. Things are gonna change in your life. What will your reaction be? What will the reaction of your group be? Gossip, meeting after the meeting, complaining, I wish they did this and I wish they told me that and I wish they, right? Character is better than competence. And character will help us, help lead us into and survive change, creative thinking, and the unknown. <clears throat> and just because someone has experience in something doesn't mean they have credibility. Is it okay if I offend you for a second? Because I love you. Some people left Trinity Life in bad standing. Leaders left over unresolved relationship issues. So did members. Some people have already moved on to other churches. Some of those people have moved on to other churches, carried with them their bitterness and their strife, their wounds. And it's multiplied. And they've had to move on again already. That's sad. It's not the Jesus way. Members left without doing Matthew 18. Arguments over strategy or implementation. And when that started to hinder the relationship, instead of doing Matthew 18 to heal the relationship, fighting continued about those things and dispersed the people. Because, and I, I've seen this for 10 years, I've seen this that at a certain point, the issue isn't the issue anymore. The issue is the relationship. And people hurt in relationship, 
people are healed in relationship. And we must be a people that's focused on healing relationships, not just bickering about issues. So wherever we go, please heal your relationship. Because most people who left, they're not qualified to lead in the church. Their next church. Because repentance and reconciliation must occur. Or else you will reap the harvest of what you sow. Okay. See, when repentance and reconciliation happen, you can be sent out. Instead of not known in the book, you can be sent out in blessing and have your name in the book. Be part of the family. Instead of having to fight for your spot, you're a son. You're a son. And lastly, we see that generosity fuels hospitality. So the whole assembly was together, 42,360 besides their male and female servants of whom there were 7,000, so almost 50,000 people here. They had all these things, singers, uh, horses, mules, camels, donkeys. Now, some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 1, derricks, gold, 50 basins, uh, 30 priest garments, 500 meters of silver. And some of the heads of the father's households gave to the treasury 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,200 meters of silver. And uh, what the rest of the people gave was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 meters of silver, 67 priest garments. So the priests and the Levites and the gatekeepers and the singers, some of the people, uh, the temple servant, and all Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. Wholeness, shalom. People were able to be welcomed home. About 50,000 people give upwards of potentially, if you equate, it's hard to calculate, right? But uh, potentially about half a billion dollars in today's money. Wild. So Nehemiah gives the most as an individual. And then all the rich people give about half of the rest of that. And then everybody else give about half of the rest of that. So everybody plays their part and the leader sets the example. And this produces revival in their city, revival in their neighborhood. See, worship can continue. God's word can be preached. Jesus can now come to fulfill the promise of Abraham, right? So when the church stands in unity in a city, in a place, it becomes powerful in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Supernatural anointing covers God's people. Supernatural power comes amongst the people of Jesus. Supernatural influence can be had. And God blesses the people who stand in unity and relationship and who give generously to the effort and to the mission so they can reap a harvest. And why? Why does he bless that? Because it's all about Jesus coming to save the world, right? The temple had to be open so the Messiah could come and the prophecies could be fulfilled. Jesus wants to bring healing for your soul. Jesus wants to bring healing for your neighborhood. Jesus wants to bring healing for your marriage. Guys, we've seen marriages falling apart. Jesus wants to bring healing for your body. And Jesus wants you to experience victory in your sorrow. And no matter where you end up, no matter how long you have left here with us, be generous and open the doors of hospitality so that Jesus can be made great in your city and in your life. Guys, let's become friends in reaping. So today, talk about all this stuff with your R3 and your R3 leaders. Have a great time together, and I bless you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the ultimate reaper of his friends, so that he can see them reconciled back to a loving Father. Be the harvest of Jesus today, church. We'll see you soon.